Welcome to the Wednesday Night Bible Class at the Dover Church of Christ. Tonight we'll be discussing the gospel, what it is, what it isn't, and some of the benefits that Christians have because of Jesus Christ. So, what we are doing this evening is we are rounding out our discussion about Jesus, though we could go on about, about him and, and all these things for forever. Uh, we are changing from... We're, t- we're turning our attention from Jesus, the man, to the plan. We're going to begin our discussion on the gospel, or the good news. And so I hope that we'll accomplish the following as we go through this particular study. I hope to give a simplified explanation through scripture of what the gospel is. Very simple. We, Again, when, when we're dealing with this stuff, we could... Go on forever, but we're going to try and keep it simple because we want stuff that we can present to somebody else that we can know ourselves. So we're going to keep it simple as can be. We're going to discuss what the gospel is not. That's also important. We'll discuss some of the particular elements of the gospel, what it accomplishes for the Christian. We're going to zoom in on some some particulars. Um... And we will have, hopefully, a better understanding of this vitally important saving message that's associated with our Savior. So, one of the things that I want us to consider this evening is that the fact that there is good news means what? There's also bad news. There's bad news. (laughs) The fact that we have good news, the fact that there is a gospel, means that there's also bad news, and we have to have a good understanding of that bad news as well. The fact that God gave man a message that was designed to bring salvation to him means that apart from him, apart from that message, man can't be what? Can't be saved. If God put forth a saving message and you don't have that message, you can't be saved. So we have to make sure we understand that as well. And consider that. So what we want to do is we want to make we want to make sure that the gospel that we present to the, the people around us is accurate. That is an accurate representation of what God has accomplished for them and what they're to respond to. We want to make sure that we're direct in our presentation of this gospel. What I mean by that is they cannot leave the conversation missing their need for it. We, we want to make sure we get to the point why you need this gospel. We want to make sure that it shows them that they can only be saved in Jesus. And being saved in Jesus means being part of this church. We have, to, we have to seal the deal with all of that. So I want to ask you this question, guys. When I bring up the word gospel, or when we talk about the gospel, what, what kind of things pop into your mind? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? The, the gospel accounts, right? We think about that. Acts. The book of Acts. What do you mean? Are you looking for word association? No, that, not necessarily. What, when I say, all right, Joe, what is the gospel? What, what comes to your mind? Oh, it's the good news. That, it's just the good news that we, we find ourselves in a predicament that we can't get out of. I like that. He said, the good news that we find ourselves in a predicament we can't get out of, yeah. and that somebody is able to get us out of it. That's, that's pretty straightforward. Any, anybody else? What comes to mind when, when you hear the word gospel? Joy. Joy, right? <coughs> why, why do you say joy? Because it's, it kind of goes along with like what Joe was saying. You, there's always some, someone or something to help. Mm-hmm. There's, you know, if you believe and you believe in the scriptures, you can find something that will bring you joy in the midst of the worst days. Yes. Yes, that's a good point. <clears throat> Anybody else? Peace. Peace. Truth. Truth. Yes, Terry. To me, it's uh, the death, burial, and resurrection. The death, burial, and resurrection. Very good. Very good. That's actually the direction I'm going. But does anybody else have 
have something they'd like to add to that before we move forward? Salvation. Salvation, yeah. It's still Jesus. It's still Jesus. Because even though we're switching from the man to the plan, the plan is the man is at the center of the plan. That's right. Was anybody able to hear that? Okay. Uh, even though we're switching from the man to the plan, it's still about Jesus because you can't have the plan without the man. Does that make sense? Is that what you're getting at? All through the Old Testament, they were getting ready for the Messiah. Yes. He's everything. He's the message of the Bible before he came. He's the message of the Bible after he left. That's right. And, and the plan, he's at the heart of the plan. That's right. Jesus is at the heart of the plan. The Old Testament's looking forward to, to him fulfilling that plan. And the rest of the New Testament is looking back at him having fulfilled that plan. So that's, that's a great point, Randy. Thank you for bringing that up. Well, Terry brought it up, so we're going to just go ahead and get into it. Thank you, Terry. The gospel, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, which we'll be turning to, he says that the gospel is of first importance. I brought to you what is of first importance, and the gospel is made possible through the person of Jesus Christ, like we've discussed in part already. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and give them a flip over to 1 Corinthians 15. I hope you have your Bible flipping fingers on, and we'll, we have some, some verses to look at. Bible flipping fingers. That's Ellie. That's what? That's Ellie. That's Ellie. Yeah, your, your fingers are a little out of, out of commission right now, aren't they? I hope, hope they're feeling better. That's not right at all. No. <laughs> Only if she's left-handed. Only if you're left-handed. Are you feeling better? How they feel? Thank you. Very good. I'm glad to hear it. All right. First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, if we could have somebody read that. Now I make known to you, brother, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, Hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Very good. Thank you, Rick. All right. So I want to make a few observations in this text that give us a little bit of a, a closer glimpse at the gospel itself. One thing that we notice from these few verses is that we receive the gospel through preaching. Paul delivered it to these people. Another thing that we see, there is, well, let's, let's look at this a little closer. I would now remind you, brothers, of the gospel which I preached to you, which you received, in which you now, what? Stand. Stand. What, what other translations might we have? Everybody got stand? Stand. All right, we stand in the gospel. What does it mean to stand on the gospel or in the gospel? The New International says, taken your stand. Have taken your stand. Very good, I like that. If, I, if I'm standing on a platform and everything else is moving around me, this platform is my foundation, right? So the gospel is the thing that we take our stand on. It is our, our foundational piece that we're standing upon. So we receive it through preaching. We stand upon it like the foundation so that we're not moved. But what else do we see? When we're standing upon this gospel... By which you are saved, or some translations will say being saved. It's a continual thing. So when you're standing on the gospel, you are continually standing in a position of salvation. Does that make sense? Any comments or questions before we move, move forward from that? 
All right, so then since that's the case, since we receive this gospel and we stand on it and we remain on it for salvation, what does Paul then encourage his readers to do? If you hold fast to it, right? Hold fast to that foundation that you've been given, that you've received. Don't step off of it. Don't step outside of that realm of, of gospel salvation. That's Paul's point. You've received this, anchor yourself down deep into it. All right? So it's conditional. It is conditional, right? So what happens if you step off of the gospel as your foundation? It's not good, right? It's not good if you step off of the gospel as your of the gospel as your foundation for your salvation. <clears throat> so as we move through that, we see that those who do not hold fast to the gospel are said to believe in vain. Believe in vain. What is vanity? Self-pride. Self-pride, right? It's, it's kind of just, it's not necessarily of any value, it's just a vain thing. Of no account. Meaningless. Meaningless. Right? So it, those who don't hold fast to this gospel are said to believe in vain. Their belief is just a meaningless thing because they haven't actually rooted themselves down into it. That's a vain belief. One that hasn't anchored itself into this gospel. But it, it's more than just empty. It gives the appearance of having value. That's a great point. At least to you. Whoever else puts their trust in That's a good point. He said that it's not only vain, but it, it gives you the appearance of, of doing something valuable, even though you actually haven't. I might say you're, you've deceived yourself into thinking things are all right, and you're doing the right thing, when actually you haven't. Another way of saying it is they believe just because it was something to do, um, not necessarily doing it for the right reasons. So as we move through our text, let's look at verse 3 and 4. What can we see here? For I delivered to you as of first importance what also I received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. There are three actions that we see here that Paul describes as the gospel. What are they? I know you know, Terry. What are they? Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. These three actions performed by Jesus confirm three things for us. And that's what I want to look at here just in, in just a second. The first is death. Jesus underwent dying. What does his death, what message does Jesus dying for sins confirm for us? Sin is deadly. Sin is deadly. That's right on. God takes sin very, very seriously. So seriously that it requires somebody to die for it. That's the point that he's getting at. Death confirms for us the holiness and the justice of God because sin was punished. So that's something we have to take into account for ourselves. That God takes our sin very seriously and that our sin deserves punishment. That's part of the gospel we have to understand. What's the next action that we see Jesus undergoing? A burial. A burial. All right. Have you ever heard the phrase, let's bury the hatchet? Right? That's, that's one we've heard. Bury the hatchet. What is that phrase getting at? Let's say Joe and I have a beef between each other. And we're say, we say, you know what? We don't want to have this beef anymore. Let's bury the hatchet. Put an end to it. We're going to put it away. We're done with this. And, and I think this is a point that we sometimes skim over with, with this passage. 
the burial confirms something for us. What do you think it is that it's, it confirms for us? An atonement. Right, there's an atonement. What, what is atonement? Well, uh, if, if it were... Well, I, I just go right to uh, 1 Corinthians 5.17. Old things are passed away. All things are, It's a clean slate. Right. Done away with. It's right. Gone. Yeah, you're, you're putting away the old self, right? The old man of sin right. is, is buried and put away with. So we, we have not only sin being punished and the righteousness and the, the holiness and the justice of God being upheld, where we see that our sin deserves that punishment. We deserve to die for our sins. We see the second thing that needs to be confirmed for us, the finality of that punishment and the finality of putting that old man of sin away. That's the second aspect of the gospel. It's that putting away for good, burying the hatchet, so to speak, between you and God. And that brings us to the third action that we see carried out by Jesus. After the death and after the burial, what happens next? A resurrection. A resurrection. Isn't that wonderful? What does a resurrection confirm for us? Wait, 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 one second. Yes, ma'am. away from the death pretty fast, or the burial pretty fast. Um, Jesus was God, mm -hmm. but he came in the form of a human and had to suffer as a human suffers. Mm -hmm. He didn't have the godly um, wherewithal to escape the punishment. That he didn't deserve. He could have said, okay, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm done with this. I'm not going through this. Mm -hmm. And he didn't. He let himself be run over by humans. Yeah. Even though he was so much <clears throat> above humans. Right. And then being separated from his father must have been horrible. And have to enter the world of we don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the and deal with that. I mean, it was Jesus it was, willingly was, submitting himself to all that stuff. <clears throat> it blows my mind what he did. <clears throat> I mean, there could have been another way, but that's the one that God chose because that's ultimate. Mm -hmm. and it's just oh. <clears throat> No, we can't thank him enough for what he, what he went through. So we, we have the death, uh, we have the burial, and, and we're moving now to the resurrection. The, the resurrection confirms for us a new state of being, a new state of life, a newness of life, as Romans chapter 6 describes. <clears throat> now, that's important for us to realize, too. That part of the gospel message is not only that sin is punished because it needs to be. Not only do we put away that old man of sin because that's part of the gospel. It's putting away that old man of sin. Um, but also that we are looking forward to a newness of life after that's all done. Does that make sense? All right. Now, what's interesting here and I think is worth noting is that Paul says all of this is accordance with is in accordance with the scriptures. Well, what does that mean that it's in, in accordance with the scriptures? What scriptures is he talking about? Prophets. Yeah. Old, Old Testament yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. Right? The prophecy. We're we're looking at looking at Old Testament scriptures. Now, you may know this or not, but the Old Testament canon, all the Old Testament books of the Bible had stopped being written about 400 years prior to the life of Jesus. So what that tells us is, is this stuff was in the mind of God way before it even came to be. This was a plan from before the foundation of the world that was described in the Old Testament that we can go back and see and see that God was really working this out for us. I just think that's really cool and worth mentioning. And if you would like some, some references, we can, we can do that. But we are 
not going to finish if we don't <laughs> don't keep moving on a little bit. Um, yeah, but if somebody asks us, we need those references. Yeah. I have them. If you'd like, you want them? How fast can you write? Uh, Isaiah fifty three. Daniel 9, 26. Zechariah 13, 7. Hosea 6, 2. Psalm 16, 10. And if it's not 10, it's 16, because my handwriting is terrible. <laughs> but these are all said to be references to what Paul is getting at here. Now, some of them are pretty clear, and some of them are not so clear, at least to me. Maybe they'll be more clear to you, but they're all said to be references to, to this. Did we miss one? Okay. So you, you might be hearing all this. All right, that's, that's the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection. Now you might be asking yourself, how do we then fit into the picture? Where, where does our part come in? Well, our part comes in with our response to that information being presented. Remember Peter in Acts chapter 2? What must the, the Peter, Peter preached his sermon and the people responded, what must we do to be, to be saved? They're looking for the response to the information that they've just been given. The presentation of the gospel. So, our part comes in with our response to the gospel. Let's turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, and we'll read verses 3 through 11. Paul says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order, just, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So we're... We're going to need to go through this quickly. When a person has truly believed this message, and they have repented, and they have confessed Christ as Lord, this is the step that they need to go to. This is their response to that. Now, baptism is the God-prescribed response to the gospel, to the gospel message. And this passage tells us why. We, we've looked at these things. It unites us with Christ's death. Those, that punishment for sins that Christ bore for us. It unites us with his burial. That final putting away of sin like we discussed earlier. Putting away that old man of sin. And it also tells us that it, it unites us in a resurrection like his. Now there's, there's two senses of, of that resurrection that newness of life that we have as born-again Christians, people who have been born into the family of God while we're still here on earth. But there's also the resurrected sense of after the final judgment, where we'll be with God eternally after that resurrection. So we know the gospel plan of salvation. We've, we've heard all of this. Now how many of you know that, that excellent little tool that we use with the the five and six fingers. If, you, if I were to ask you, what is the gospel plan of salvation? What is it that we like to go to? Hear, 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 hear believe, repent, confess, be baptized. And if you have six fingers on one hand, it's easier. 
live faithfully, right? Well, this is a great tool and one that I believe we should utilize in showing people how they respond to the gospel. But we have to realize that those, that six-figure rule is not itself the gospel. We have to keep that in mind. They are how a person must respond to the gospel. They should hear the gospel, right? They should hear it. They must hear it. They can't be saved unless they do. They must believe the gospel. Why is it important that they actually believe the gospel? That God, that Jesus actually died, was buried, and rose again. It does no good if you don't believe it. Yeah. What, what good is it if you don't believe it? Without faith, it's impossible. Right. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Right. Yeah, undergoing baptism is useless unless you believe. You're just getting wet. Yep. Repentance. A person must repent. That's, that's part of the process. Turning away from that sin that put Christ on the cross. It's, it's absolutely necessary. But again, if you don't actually believe, why in the world would you repent? You won't. So they have to believe. They must confess Christ. And again... If you don't believe, you're, you're not going to confess Christ. And the same goes for baptism and living faithfully. If you don't believe the message that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for you, you're not going to undergo that six-finger technique that we like to teach. So, let's turn our attention now, in our last few minutes, I hope we can do this. What does the gospel believed and obeyed do for the Christian. We've touched on a few of these things already. Peace with God. We have peace with God because of this gospel. Since we're still in Romans, just flip a page over to Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith in what? Jesus and his gospel. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God because of this gospel, one of the benefits that we have. Galatians 5.13. If anybody would like to read that, go ahead. Galatians 5.13. Yes. You, my brothers, are called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. Thank you, Larry. The gospel calls us to freedom. Freedom in Christ. Not licensure to be sinful, but freedom. So we have peace with God through the gospel. We have freedom because of the gospel. What about hope? We have hope because of the gospel. There's a lot of verses we could turn to for that. Ephesians 1.18 and Ephesians 4.4 4 talk about the hope that the Christian has because of the gospel. Holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4.7 The gospel calls us to holiness. And we can be holy because of the gospel. It puts us in a position where we can actually be holy before God. Endurance. Let's look at this one. 1 Peter 3.9. Peter writes, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. What he's getting at is endurance through suffering. When people revile you, 
when people come against you, the gospel calls you to be able to endure those things. Because those things really ultimately don't matter. The gospel calls us to eternal life. 1 Peter 6.12 If you need me to repeat a reference, just holler at me. 1 Timothy 6.12 Fight the good fight. Yes, ma'am. You said Peter. Is it Timothy? Peter. Did I say? Uh, yeah, 1 First, First Timothy 6.12 And the one before that was 1 Peter 3.9. So... Good catch. Paul writes to Timothy in uh, 1 Peter 6.12, Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So what are, what are some of the other things you might be able to think of that the gospel provides for those who believe it and obey it? You're in the family of God. You're in the family of God. Adoption. We're gonna we're gonna cover that one a little bit more closely later on. We can call him our father. Call him our father. Yeah. We were united with Christ. Romans six and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Yeah. And when you're in Christ, if you look up the prepositional phrases in Christ. It's rich with the blessings that are there. Yeah. In Ephesians. Yes. Really Was that Ephesians 1? Yeah. Where we're united with Christ, in Christ, and in Him all the spiritual blessings we can have. Anybody else want to add to that? All right, we'll move on and we'll. There's fellowship. Fellowship? Yeah. Yeah, it's a different kind of fellowship within the body of Christ, isn't it? It's a, a different kind and quality of fellowship, unlike what you have in the world. And it's really a beautiful thing. <clears throat> David, I missed the scriptures, the peace, freedom, and hope. Peace was Romans 5 1. Freedom, Galatians 5 13. And hope. Ephesians 1 8 and 4 4. Thank you. All right. What I'd like to speedily go through now is so since we've established that the gospel is, is the power of God unto salvation, it's the message that everybody needs to hear and believe and respond to, how does God connect people to that power? That's an important question. And what we're, I want to look at in particular is the method that he's employed to get people to that message. So let's look at John 6, 44 through 45. Now, if you've been here on Sunday mornings, we've, we've gone over this, but it's been a little, bit of, a little bit of time since then. But Jesus says that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. No one comes to Jesus. Nobody obeys the gospel unless he is drawn by the Father. Now, if you're here, you already know the answer that we went over in the sermon. Let's see if anybody remembers. How does God draw somebody to Jesus? They're taught, they hear, and they learn. Was that you said? Yeah. Good, good answer. They're taught by God, they hear, and they learn. What does it mean to be taught by God? It means that God's message is proclaimed to them. It's preaching. That is the method that God has chosen to employ to connect people to his saving power. is through preaching. The catch is, they have to hear. They have to be listening. Right? And the proof of them listening is found in them learning. Now, you can listen to something and, 
it'll stick in your mind for a second and then it's out the other ear and it's gone. You haven't actually learned the thing yet, if that's the case. To learn is to take that message and internalize it. To, to mull it over, think about it, and have it actually affect your life. That's how God draws people to Jesus. It's through preaching. They hear that preaching. They internalize it, and it actually affects their lives to do something with that information. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yes. Big catch. Yes, we want to make sure that we're presenting the right gospel. Uh, if you read Galatians 1, that whole chapter is about Paul warning, don't preach another gospel. If it's me, if it's an angel, or anybody else that brings to you another gospel, let them be accursed. Right? We, we, we got to get the gospel right. Good, good point, Terry. Thank you. But this is the method that God has chosen to connect people with that saving power. Now, the habit, though, is love. Yes. And Jesus said, if, I, if and God, if I be lifted up, we'll draw all men to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's what there is about the message that draws people. They can see the love of Jesus. That's right. Yes, the, the fact that Jesus was lifted up on the cross is a proclamation of his love. And that, that love and this message cannot be separated. They go together. That There's no separating it out from there. So, here's something we also need to consider with this in mind. We don't know who is going to be listening and who's going to be responding favorably to this message, do we? We don't know. It could be anybody at any time. So, since we don't know to whom and how often should we share this message? Everybody all the time. To anyone who is going to listen. You don't know if they're listening. So to anyone. To anyone who will listen at any time. And so since this is the method that God has chosen, and we don't know who's listening or, or when they'll listen, we're going to need to conclude a few things. There's a possibility that if we do preach, those people won't be listening and won't be affected by that message and nothing's going to happen. There's a possibility that we could go our whole lives like Noah and nobody's going to hear, our, hear the word of the Lord and respond to it. It's possible. But to go with that, if we do nothing, we've guaranteed that nothing's going to happen because we haven't employed God's method of bringing salvation to people. We have to do something. And we have to bring this message. We've got to get it right. But at the same time, if we're not living right, if we're short-tempered, if we're, uh, yes. we fly off the handle for something, or we, we do things we sh that go against what God wants, we're preaching. Yes, that's a good point. If, if our lives are contrary to the message we're preaching, we're, we're preaching a different message, really. And it's not one that matches the one that saves. Yep. Don't don't be a hypocrite and drive somebody away with it. We gotta be very careful. Just to go with that, Paul said in Romans ten, seventeen, faith comes by hearing. hearing, hearing through the word of Christ. That's his method. So we'll wrap it up and then we'll have a song and a prayer. Is that right? We've discussed what the gospel is and what it is not. We've talked about some of the benefits that a person in Christ receives only when they're in Christ, when that gospel is believed and obeyed. We've talked about the method that God uses to bring people to Jesus through the preaching of his word that they're taught, that they hear, and that they learn. What remains for us now is to make sure that we know these things for ourselves. We have to be able to apply this stuff to ourselves. Know that Jesus died for me was buried, that we're united with him in that burial where we can put that old person sent away for good, and that we have a, a resurrected life. We are a new creature in Christ, and we look forward to that resurrection day to be with our Lord forever. We need to know that first so that we can share that same message with somebody else. And so next week, what I want to do
just a little preview is I, I want to begin to break down some of the particulars of the gospel into a little bit smaller pieces because I think they're important and I think they'll be beneficial for us to look at. Things like atonement and justification, <coughs> adoption and so on. So we'll get into those and uh, I thank you for an excellent class tonight and your participation. And Joe, if you'd like to do our song. and. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for joining the Dover Church of Christ for our Wednesday night Bible study. We hope the materials presented were beneficial to you. If you have any questions, please reach out to us at doverchurchofchrist.net on our contacts page.